now our discussion on sleep. There is a relationship between sleep and stress. Stress can interfere with our ability to sleep. And being able to sleep doesn't necessarily reduce stress. But what it does show is that if you are able to fall asleep after a stressful event, you're at least able to achieve a relaxation response. And relaxation is an important part of coping with stress. Why sleep? Sleep is an essential period of rest and recovery from the effects of wakefulness. It's your body's method of housekeeping. During this period of sleep, your body is able to repair damaged tissue, to rebuild neural connections for memory and for learning. We'll talk about why staying up all night to study for an exam isn't always the best way of learning the material. There's a lot going on when you sleep that's important in maintaining your health, both mental and physical. Circadian rhythms are part of what controls our sleep. These rhythms refer to a 24-hour cycle of physiological and behavioral functioning. It also refers to our biological clock, which is located deep in the hypothalamus. Remember, we just talked about the HPA axis. This hypothalamus is in, located in the brain where nerves cross. And one of the important pieces of where these nerves cross is something called the suprachiasmic nuclei, or SCN. These SCN make up our biological clock. They're active during the day, and they are inactive during the night. And the function of these suprachiastic nuclei is to regulate melatonin. During the day, melatonin is switched off. And at night, a signal is sent to a gland in the brain to release melatonin. Some of you may take melatonin. Do you know why? It's known as a relaxation hormone, and it is something that we normally produce that's involved in sleep. The brain goes through two phases during sleep, and it cycles back and forth between them. The first one is called rapid eye movement, or REM sleep. And about 25% of the time spent in sleep is in this single stage. Then there's the non-rapid eye movement, or NREM sleep, or non-REM sleep. And the rest of it is spent in this stage. Each set of REM and non-REM sleep is repeated about four or five times during the night with each lasting about 90 to 110 minutes. There are a number of different diagrams looking at the different stages of sleep. This is just one that I chose for our class. Let me go through these with you. Stage one is very light sleep. As a matter of fact, during stage one, you may not even know that you're asleep. You're easily awakened, you may be jolted, and again, you might not even realize you're asleep. Stage two occurs as the brain waves begin to slow down and you transition into deeper sleep. Stage three is when deep sleep begins. Your brain starts to generate what are called slow delta waves. And stage four is very deep sleep. You're breathing rhythmically, you have very limited muscle activity, and your brain is continuing to produce these delta waves. Learning increases the number of connections between neurons in the brain. This is referred to as plasticity. And four hours of sleep can produce more connections than eight hours of studying. One research scientist at UC San Francisco states, if you reviewed your notes thoroughly until you were tired and then slept, you would achieve as much plasticity or learning in the brain as if you pulled an all-nighter repeating your review of the material. Sleep deprivation is the lack of sufficient time of sleep. It can result in daytime drowsiness and it can impair physical, emotional, and cognitive functioning. Sleep debt, the amount of sleep you get minus the sleep you need to stay alert during the day. Your sleep debt can accumulate and harm your body's ability to function. This is something that 
is going to be covered in the assignment for this particular topic. Studies suggest that sleep deprivation on hospital residents can be, in some cases, fatal. Some interns can work 24 to 30 hour shifts, although in some hospitals changes are beginning to occur. But some medical students still average over 100 hours of work per week, and they may average less than five hours of sleep per night. Studies suggest that the result of this sleep deprivation can cause impaired memory, judgment, and vigilance, increased probability of medical errors, and a high rate of car accidents. My suggestion is that if you have to go to an emergency room, you ask whoever is working with you how much sleep they had before they saw you. There are a number of disorders associated with sleeping issues. We're going to look at what are called dysomnias and parasomnias. Dysomnias are conditions that happen while you are awake or that cause you to wake up. Parasomnias are conditions that affect you during your sleep. Some examples of dysomnias include insomnia, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and so on. Parasomnias, sleepwalking, nighttime eating, night terrors or nightmare disorder, and something we'll spend a little more time discussing, REM behavior disorder. REM behavior disorder is what occurs in individuals who physically act out their dreams while they're asleep. In most people, conscious muscle control is switched off while sleeping. But with this disorder, neurological barriers break down. And we'll talk about how it's related to the neurotransmitter dopamine. Once again, dopamine shows its presence. It usually starts after the age of 50 and it is sometimes a precursor of degenerative brain disorders such as Parkinson's or dementia. In obstructive sleep apnea, the airway gets blocked during sleep and it causes the individual to wake up. The muscles relax during sleep, closing the windpipe, the pipe that gets the air that you inhale into your lungs, and breathing can stop for a few seconds or up to a minute. What's happening during this time is falling blood levels of oxygen cause the person to wake up, hopefully enough to tighten those airway muscles and reopen the windpipe. The person may snort or gasp and then go back to normal breathing. And this cycle has been shown to occur in some individuals hundreds of times during the night. And what I can tell you is while you may hate snoring or snoring of a person who's in the same room with you, snoring does not always lead to obstructive apnea. Snoring may be what wakes the individual up, but snoring in and of itself does not lead to this condition. Sleep apnea can cause personality changes, increasing irritability or depression. It can result in a decline in mental functioning sleepiness during the day, it can give the person headaches in the morning, and it has been shown to increase risk for stroke and heart attack. This machine that this person is wearing is called a CPAP. It helps the person to continue breathing during the night. For folks who do have trouble sleeping, over-the-counter medication is very popular. Most of the medications that are available contain the antihistamine known as Benadryl, Advil PM, Tylenol PM, that PM stands for Benadryl. And there are also prescription medications. Benzodiazepam are medications that can be habit-forming. Non-benzodiazepams are said to be savior. They include Lunesta and Ambien. What are some suggestions for getting a good night's sleep? You can certainly pause this and have a look to see what works for you. Other therapies for insomnia include cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, what you're trying to do is recognize what it is that is impairing your ability to fall asleep. For some, it has been shown to be very effective and long lasting, but it may take a while to have an effect. Some folks have tried alternative remedies like K2 
chamomile or melatonin or even the amino acid tryptophan. Results will vary.